Why, hello. That's good yeah. evening, my friends and family. Yeah. Good evening. Hi there. Good evening. Wow. Hey. Well, let's stand up. What's up, man? Let's stand up. Let's get ready to worship because God is good all the time. All the time. And all the time. Amen. You know, God's sovereign and he could have quieted the animals and it could have been peaceful, but you know, really in, in what we know as humans, I think it, there was some chaos in the awesomeness of that night and how what that total chaos could turn into the joy of the world and how awesome it could be that we see the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Come as a baby, the most vulnerable thing that we can relate to. And not saying that I'm the white knight, I came to slay and defeat evil. But he says, I came as a baby to defeat evil. 
to love on people, and to change their hearts. Not to come in knocking people down, cutting them off at the knees, but to raise them up in fellowship and in family for the sake of the kingdom. That's the joy that the world gets to know because of that baby. Amen? Amen. Well, let's sing some joy to the world.
thank you for the divine night that you came to love on us, to share with us, to call us, to be yours, to receive and inherit all the amazingness of the kingdom, the authority and the power of the name of Jesus, as well as the Holy Spirit. God, you are awesome. You are so awesome. We thank you and we praise you for being you. And we ask your presence remain here with us as the message comes forth. Let it be a challenging message that stirs and encourages our heart to be better disciples, to be more focused on you, Lord, and to share your love and compassion through us. Again, Lord, we thank you, praise you, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to set that challenge to come with you guys with something challenging. So we talked last week about uh, what do you want for Christmas. These are two things you're going to hear this season. Before Christmas comes, you hear, what do we want for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas? And then after Christmas, you're asked, what did you get for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas? What do you get for Christmas? And uh, we talked about opening up uh, our ability to share the gospel. With Christ. That's something I want for Christmas to be able to take the blessings that we've given as the salvation came on Christmas morning uh, on that rescue mission. But before we start that, Ryan's going to play a video because we're going to be talking about being prepared, preparing the way for the Lord, being prepared in our hearts to what Christmas really meant, being prepared to go out into the mission field. But before we start that, I'm going to go ahead and say a prayer. Lord, uh, thank you for this time to come together. Help us to always be about your business. That we should be talking about Christmas year-round, Lord. Salvation. You came as a redeemer. And you showed up. And that, that Christmas is a celebration of that. But it should carry on all year round. The cross, the empty tomb in that manger, Lord. You made a way in that manger. And you are the way, Lord. Help us to always be mindful of that and showing that to a lost world. In Jesus' name. Okay, so I want you guys to be prepared. So we're going to play a little uh, clip here. This is more not prepared. This is self-defense here, of course. Son. And he gave the ultimate, his life. 
So we want to prepare our hearts. And that's kind of what Advent season is. It's a preparation where we come and we think, okay, let's reflect on what all God has done, not just in our lives, but in all of human history, what he's doing and what he's going to do. Isaiah 53, it says he was a tender plant. So I want you to picture this. It says here, Isaiah 53, 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of a dry ground. When that baby was born in Bethlehem, in that manger, he was human 100%. He was God 100%. But as a human, he was susceptible to everything that humans... They had to flee to Egypt because Herod says, Kill them all! All kids under two! I want them out of here! I want them dead! Can you guys ever stop and picture that? Soldiers breaking down doors, going into tents with spears, and bludgeoning, and killing, and blood everywhere, and killing all these babies. Can you understand the, the uh, immense weeping and, and sorrow of these kids being killed because the devil wanted to take out this king who was challenging his authority? So Jesus... And he says he grew up as a tender plant. I want to bookend this. I want to bookend Jesus as a tender plant. So here's a question. Are you prepared for the coming king? It's not going to be Revelation 19. So Jesus came on that Christmas morning in a manger, birthed from a virgin womb. By the Holy Spirit power, he was conceived. But before he came as that baby, he was the everlasting, eternal Son of God, the Word of God. He had always been in perfect communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He was the Word of God. This powerful, all-powerful God who when he spoke, the world's left into existence. And he made the seasons. And he made the sun and the moon and the stars and the universe and everything in it. And he made humans. And he made animals. And he gave us souls. And everything is held together by him. This almighty God was everlasting before that baby came in that manger. That's the one bookend. From eternity past, Jesus, the word of God, the eternal Son of God was there. Then let's read in Revelation. Revelation 11. I want you guys to picture this. Christ is coming back again. And this is how he's going to appear. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. <coughs> From his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with an iron rod. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the other book yet. This is Jesus. This is the word of God. The apostle John said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. The word was with God. He's always been. And then he said he became flesh. That's what happened in that manger. The word there is uh, tabernacle. It means a tent. He dwelt with us. If you look at some translations, it says the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. That word dwelt is tabernacle, which is a tent. So God pitched his tent among humanity as one of them. A savior who is not distant. A savior who did not wind this world up, put us here, and then take off to some parallel universe and leave us on our own. You guys remember who wa wa watched Andy Griffith? There's some of you in here who have seen Randy Griffith when it was on, you know, during the actual season it was on TV. Other of us watched it, reruns. And I grew up with the reruns, and, and Barney Clive to me is the greatest uh, 
sitcom comedian there ever was. But you remember how he would pick up the phone, Sarah, get me through to the barbershop. And there was a person on the other line who was human and tangible, and you could ask questions and be personable. That's what God is. He is there at the ready. He is not like it is nowadays, where you call and they ask you what language you want, English or, or uh, Spanish, and then they, they give you a list of things, options, and then you go to this option, and if your option isn't there, you hit this option, and you get somebody, you go, oh, finally, I got somebody. They don't know the answer. And they say they're going to transfer. And you go, no, 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 don't transfer. Please, 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 don't, don't transfer. They transfer you anyways. And then you're on hold. And then it hangs up. And you go, oh, I just spent 45 minutes. My whole lunch break is gone trying to pay this bill or find out why this discrepancy. That's not how our God is. Our God is here in real time, tangible. You can pick up that prayer line and say, God. And he goes, hey, I already know what you want. And, I, and I'll put you right through to the throne. You're here, baby. Immediate access. So ask yourself a question. Are you prepared for the coming king? Because there was one that the prophets talked about. One that would be in the spirit of Elijah. That would call men to prepare themselves for the coming of the Messiah. The coming of the conquering king. And everybody was expecting this conquering king like you see at his second coming. A robe dipped in blood. Jesus is not some timid pushover. This is almighty God coming with the armies of heaven behind him. His eyes are burning flame. He's got a sword coming out of his mouth which to smite the nations. He carries a scepter, an iron scepter for which he will rule over the nations. So all these corrupt governments and all these corrupt laws and all these people who are shaking their fists at God will be bowing down. Not necessarily because he wants you, because he will have to. The sheer presence of God will force everyone to their knees. That is his holiness. That is his awesomeness. So, is your heart prepared for the coming of God, the King? He didn't come conquering, no. We know he came as a suffering servant. One who would go and die in place of the very humans he took on flesh to become one of. So that he could actually be a substitute. So John the Baptist prepares a way. The beginning of Mark, he talks about it. This is how Mark starts his gospel off. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Mark's saying right off the bat, Jesus, he doesn't say... Uh, the, the baby from Bethlehem. He doesn't say the man from Nazareth. Those things are all true. He says, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He wants you to know right up front, this is what I'm talking about, the good news of Jesus Christ. But before he came, he says, and he's quoting Isaiah, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. It says, John the Baptist came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That all the land of Judea and those of Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River. What were they doing out there before they were baptized? They confessed their sins. They were preparing their hearts. Now, before th th this, look at this in a figure. As a type, I should say. A, a foreshadowing of what we actually do when we come to the Savior. When we come to Jesus, we have to get our hearts right with Jesus. We have to know, okay, we messed up, we will continue to mess up, and we can't stop messing up. We are sorry for that. So for confessing your sins is showing contrition, showing that you're sorry for that. Like a baby, when, he, when they do something wrong, like Amelia, will her lip will quiver, or she'll pout her lip out. She's showing, okay, I understand I did something wrong. And then she'll come over and she'll lay her head on you. That's her saying, I'm sorry. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to confess and admit, okay, yes, I did wrong. And I'm sorry about it. So that was what John the Baptist was preparing to people. You guys, the king is coming. You better be right. You guys remember them old movies, maybe like Gilmore Pile or something else where, boy, that's, isn't Gilmore Pile a spinoff Andy Griffin? Yes. Boy, I'm, I'm stuck in Mayberry. <laughs> Where, like, there'd be a, 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 what do they stay in? Barracks. Barracks. All right, barracks inspection. And the, the word will come out, the general's coming, the general's coming. Or on MASH. And Hawkeye and Honeycutt didn't care who 
was coming. They didn't clean the swamp up. But it was a big deal. The general's coming. And the higher commands, the colonels, and the captains would be running around. You know, all right, you guys got to get your beds right. You guys got to get your footlockers right. You guys got everything right. That's what John the Baptist is saying. The king is coming. Prepare your hearts. Repent of your sins. Get right with God. And that kind of echoes what we need to do. At this time of season, we need to reflect on, okay, are we preparing our hearts for the joy that God has filled in it by redemption? What do I want for Christmas? What's the best Christmas gift? A new life, born in heaven, born from above, born again. That's the best Christmas gift there ever will be. What do, what, what do I want to do with that? I, I want to share that with other people. So we got to prepare ourselves and thank God and just have a time of reflection, but also a mandate to go forward that we tell people about Christmas and about the cross and about the empty tomb and about the one who's coming again with a, a, a rope dipped in blood. Oh boy, that's small. So Luke 1, 16, 17. Here's what John the Baptist is up to. Here's what John, his purpose was. It says, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We want to be a church, not the building, the body. We want to be like a, a, a school of fish that you see or a flock of birds that all turn the same way at the same time and they're a big mess and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. The birds do what birds do. The fish do what fish do. And us believers should be doing what Jesus did. We should be out there taking the good news. And I'm going to tell you about a time I did that later on that uh, I thought it was good, but in hindsight, I was uh, probably insulting the homeless man. But we'll get to there. Um, so we need to be ready, people, prepared for the Lord, for his purposes, people that he can use as instruments in his hands. So why did God choose to become human? This master plan. Jesus said, I'm up for the job. I'm going to go down. I'm going to put on flesh and blood. I'm going to enter the visible creation that I myself have created and sustained. And I'm going to fight the enemy and prevail. And I'm going to redeem my children back to me. So why did he come? So if we look at the law... In the promised land. Look at, at the Exodus. God pulled them out of bondage. God rescued the children who were in slavery for all them centuries. And he pulled them out of bondage. God was his rescuer. Israel's rescuer. And he gave them a law. He took them to Mount Sinai. He says, here's what you guys. You are my chosen people. You're going to be the, the people that bring forth the Messiah. And you're going to be the people that reflect my holiness and my righteousness. And to do that, I'm going to give you the law. This is the stuff I want you to do. This is the things I want you to be aware of. I am a holy God. I am a righteous God. I am the all-powerful God. You need to know what my holiness means. And I want you to follow. I want your society, your nation to be dictated on these laws. These are moral and just laws by which I want my nation that's going to reflect me to be guided and governed. And it also had a third effect. The law showed them that God was so holy and we are so unholy. That we can't even attempt, we can't even go a day with filling God's law completely. And we always mess up and we will always continue to mess up. So the law had them, them, them points. A society would be governed by them morally. And it will show God's holiness and purity and absolute righteousness. And it will show our sinfulness. It will be like an instructor, a schoolmaster, pointing us to the only one that can solve this problem when we come up short. It says that sin is falling short of the glory of God. So what did Jesus do? He came in and, and he took the baton from us in that race. And he says, I'm going to not fall short of God's glory. I'm going to emulate the glory of God. And I'm going to perfect what you cannot. So if you look at the law and you look at Moses, Moses was the lawgiver. But what happened to Moses? He wasn't allowed in the promised land. He couldn't go in. He had to stop short. 
And the law will always stop short of the promised land. The law will always stop short because none of us can keep it. So by the law, none of us will be justified. But there was one who was named Yeshua, Joshua, who was Moses' right-hand man. Joshua and Jesus are the same name. They're both Yeshua, and it means Savior. What the law couldn't do through Moses, God raised up Joshua, and he could go into the promised land. Joshua was the Savior, and just like the law is there, but it can never get us into heaven. Jesus says, I came and I fulfilled the law. Jesus did it to a team. He was holy, completely without sin. And like Joshua, the Savior, Yeshua, he can take us into the promised land. Because he can complete the law fully. So that's one thing Jesus came to do. He also says in Isaiah, uh, we'll get to that later, about, hey, look, he got up in front of the synagogue. And he started reading. He says, the blind has sight. Uh, the prisoners are loose. And he goes on and saying, look at all these things of prophets talked about. He goes, I am fulfilling this. Today your Messiah is here. So Jesus came and he's called, he's our substitute. He did for us what we can't do, what we could never do. And he took it and he completed it in absolute perfection. So Hosea 10, 12. This is how I want us to be prepared for Christ. To, to remember what he did. Because he knew, coming out of that virgin's womb, he knew in the distance there was a cross. And he did all this for the joy that would be after that cross. Our salvation. So John, Hosea 10, 12 says, Sow yourselves in righteousness. Reap according to mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord. So, it's a time to prepare ourselves, our hearts, and it's a time to seek after God. And, and, and I look at that, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. I look at that as, I, I see a harvest field. I see being maybe stagnant in our walk. Not in our faith, but it's like, okay, we're supposed to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and I don't feel like it's, it, it's happening. And I have that a lot in my life. I need to be doing more. You can, who, who knows Francis Chan? He had a big mega church, and he says, this is not what it's about. I need to be there in the streets like Jesus was, in with the thieves, in with the prostitutes, in with those in the society outcasted. And he, and he found somebody to replace him in his pulpit, his mega church, and he went out to be among the people. Very famous, very popular author, and he said, man, there's something missing. And I think we need to capture that in our hearts, that we need to be about the Father's business. What happens in here is great, but we need to take that rebirth life that we've been given, and we need to help bring that into other people. So I, I got my business card. Break up your fellow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. And a couple years ago, there was a homeless guy named Cyrus. And I went in, and I just came back out, and I thought... <coughs> I was like, man, what do you do when it's cold out and it's, and it's really cold? Ma, well, I got some plastic. I, I lay under and I put some cardboard over the plastic. Ma, I'm like, man, can I get you something to eat? Are you hungry? <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Uh, and I'm talking to him. And I'm like, here you go. Just take this card. He didn't take card. And I left and I thought, I was okay. And I think, what's this guy going to do with this card? What is it? Hey, buddy, when it gets really cold and it's like negative 50 out, because of the windshield, see if you can just put that on top of your plastic and maybe that'll add some extra warmth. <laughs> or if you get hungry, just go ahead and you can eat it. Or I don't know if you get anything to drink out of it, but and I'm thinking to myself, man, yeah, that was like, that guy probably is like, what, who is this? What's, he, what's a car doing? And I feel like I, I missed an opportunity. I don't know what I could have done. I don't know, you know, but it seems like there should have been more there. It should have been sitting down with them, maybe just going and getting food and coming and having a meal with them and talking to them and getting to know his situation and, and getting to know, hey, I have a Savior and I know that nobody's down and out for good if they put their trust in him and I can talk to him. But instead I said, here you go. I hope this helps. And, and, and looking back in hindsight, it was, you know, it's a learning lesson. 
But I think break up your fellow ground. I think that means stir it up inside of you. At least that's what I'm going with. I'm going to grab that and I'm going to stand on that. To, to, okay, no more handing business cards out to people who are down and out. But to get down and out with them. Like Paul says, I become all things to all people. Why? Because people think I'm cool? No, it's just I become all things to all people so that I may win some to Christ. So we need to break up that fallow ground. If our heart needs stirred up, and I think in this time of season, we can be really effective if we go out and tell people about why Christmas is the most important day. Because God entered in on this rescue mission. I'm going to close in prayer. I hope that we can use this season. And God, th this is my challenge to me. I want you to challenge me further and further, Lord, to use this season, Christmas, to proclaim your worthiness, to proclaim your unfailing love, to proclaim that nobody is down and out. There's no ten count in anybody's life as long as you're on the throne. You can always be apprehended. You can always be ascertained, Lord. I pray that we can always seek you, show others how to seek you, and, and just don't leave them there. But come alongside them. Be where they're at. Absorb their pain. Help carry their load. Help us to make it real, Lord. Not just a faith that we say, but a faith that we practice that pleases you. And if we can only do it through your, your power, Lord, I, would, I just pray this prayer for everybody in here. And we can use this season to prepare our hearts to be vessels used by you in a mighty way. In Jesus' name. stand <clears throat> to worship. I like uh, kind of twists, I like covers or renditions of or different songs. Um, this was originally done by Leonard Cohen and I like how um, the Van Cloverton is the one that rewrote the words for the song. How they twisted it just a little bit to, to glorify God and to tie in the situation that the baby boy would grow to be the savior of the world that would sacrifice himself, his heart, his body, his blood, so that we can be washed clean, so that we can be made whole through the simple act of, of birth of a baby. So I encourage you to open your hearts and to experience on a new level what God would have to reveal to us this season.
The shepherds lie there in frostbite night to see this baby wrapped in light. A host of angels led them all to A star shone bright up in the east to Bethlehem. The wise men three came many miles in journey, long for you. And to the place at which you were, the blankness and golden birth, they came. We thank you for the hallelujahs that we can cry out in the time of brokenness, in the time of celebration, at any time, because you are always worthy to be praised. We can always cry out to you, Lord, come save now as we, as we hurt, as we're challenged, as we experience new things in life, and you are always faithful. We thank you and we praise you for that, in Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus, we thank you for surrendering your throne, your kingliness, your powers to come be a human, to experience life as we experience it, so we can call on you and know that you know what it is to feel like we feel, to hurt like we hurt, and to love like we love. God, again, we thank you for your sovereignty, the blood of Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, you guys have a blessed week. Thanks for coming in. And uh, let your light shine. Christ's love to this lost world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, God bless everybody.